Before we get started, I just want to make a reminder to everybody that the information uh, discussed today is not to be interpreted or construed as investment advice. Everyone's financial situation, goals, and objectives are different. Please consult investment advice. The dirty secret is that no one's ever going to get paid back. People have the shortest memories when it comes to investment. We just got to get Keith into Bitcoin. Hey, there's a bubble. Welcome back to the Looney Hour, episode 31. As always, joined by the three amigos, we got Rich Diaz of Acorn Macro Consulting, who clearly didn't get the uh, dress code memo. Uh, and we've got everyone's favorite boomer, Keith Dicker of Ice Cap Asset Management. <laughs> Welcome back to the show. Thank you. <laughs> so let, let's kind of crack this open because I uh, sent out a tweet last night. It was crying on the couch. <laughs> uh, I'm ri- I just rode Luna crypto to, oh, no. to zero. Uh, I had a very small amount in there, but uh, yeah, it's kind of crazy. I mean, obviously, well, we're going to talk about pegs in this week's episode. So one of Rich's sort of opening lines is talking about <laughs> pegs. Um, but yeah, basically, you know, Terra breaking its peg, going from what, 100 bucks, 120 bucks to ba- essentially zero. Um, no longer being traded on Binance and many different exchanges. So, I mean, wealth is just being evaporated right now. I mean, I don't know how you guys are looking at this, the crypto space. Keith, I don't, do you have any opinions on, like, contagion? <laughs> I know you're, I mean, gosh, you don't even know what a Bitcoin is. but so, <laughs> so Bitcoin is this, like, blockchain thing. It's on the computers. Yeah. <laughs> you know, s- sometimes ignorance can help you out and your clients out. Um, so I'll just share with you our experience with, with crypto and, and Bitcoin. And I, I think you guys know if you're, if you're following the show, you know, the big joke is, you know, tr- everyone's going to try to convince me to buy Bitcoin. And uh, our strategy is we do, we do not have an allocation to it. So when we had the euphoria last year with, with all the crypto, you know, I kept looking at it and I've got a lot of really smart friends, a lot smarter than I am. I'm chatting with them. I said, what do you guys think of that? And they said, no, they couldn't figure it out either. So we, so we didn't participate How old are your friends? In, in the market. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're all my age as well. So, um, and so then what happens? So, so this is, you know, the, you know, the, the journals or, uh, you know, the, the diary of an investment manager. You know, it, you know, we like to crack jokes. That is great all the time, but there's a lot of highs and lots of lows. Um, so last year, with, with the euphoria, like we had so many people saying, hey, you need to get this, you need to buy it, and then you, you get left behind. And then all of a sudden, you're struggling. Maybe you, know, you should get it. And so that's why a lot of people get into that. They get trapped to, instead of buying low and selling high, most people do, you know, they do the opposite. And that's with all markets, you know, not, not just with the crypto market. And uh, so, you know, and obviously, so the, so the main concern with what we have with crypto, and we mentioned it before on, on the episode, it had to get institutional investors to adopt it. And I said, once that starts, then, wow, that, that's huge. And then that started last year. I think, Rich, we had the big, you know, you and I had a bit of a joke online with, uh, I think, was it Ian Y? They said that they're now going to include it on their balance sheet. Yeah. You sent it to me. I said, see, now Ian Y are going to have it on their balance <laughs> sheet, to which I joked. I said, yeah, is it an asset or liability? Yeah. Ernst and that's, Young. That's with it. <laughs> so, KPMG's got it, too. KPM- they're all going to have it. They're all, they're all going to have it. KPMG's got it on their balance sheet, too. Okay. There's another liability <laughs> on their side. But so th- what's happening now, though, and, and again, this is from an investment management perspective with fiduciaries. And think about pension committees or if you're on the, the finance committee for a, a company or, or a bank or anything. You've now seen a lot of wealth uh, just evaporate very quickly. So now, all of a sudden, if you are that person on the committee or a fiduciary, is it, it takes a brave person now to say, hey, yeah, I think we should buy this now. So I, I think this is going to be a bit of a struggle. You're not going to get institutional money coming back in for a while. It will eventually. Uh, we have target prices at, at our firm, but we would like to start adding to it or not adding, start beginning a position. So uh, I just think it's all incredibly interesting, but it's not just this crypto market. Like every market will go through this. So whether it's the tech bubble, you know, back in... 2000, if anyone remembers that, and, uh, and so forth. Tell but that's the first 
part on the whole crypto. But, oh, so you would you would be adding Bitcoin at some point, slowly accumulate. What's the best way? Of, like, I'm curious as a fiduciary investment manager, what would you do that through an ETF? Yeah, for, for us, it would be uh, through an ETF structure. Keith's and it wouldn't got the it, private keys in his house there. Everyone's yeah, yeah. <laughs> But anyway, but that's the, uh, again, like, you know, we've been talking for a while. I just think markets are just, that they're so, everything's been stretched to the extreme. And it really is euphoria in everything, both good and whatever the opposite of euphoria is. And, and, and that just creates really neat opportunities. So we like to say, you know, you never love or hate any market. You, you like or dislike it. And right now, I think we're getting to the point where a lot of markets are disliked. Maybe you should start liking them. So we're getting closer. My turn. Um, so I have a different view, obviously, which is my job. I disagree with the boomer. But um, I think there's, there's two things for me. Number one is I think people conflate sort of the euphoria in the near term with the tech and usefulness of the technology. We've talked about this before. The blockchain in some way or another is not going anywhere. Um, if, you're listen, if you listen to the podcast regularly, you know I am against something called, um, what is it, central bank digital currency, which is dovetails off of what's going on in, in the Bitcoin space. The fact that it's gone down recently is, you know, it, it's funny, people, when things go up, people cheer, and when things go down, people wring their hands, and um, I also think Bitcoin gets a lot of press because it's, it's new, it's newfangled, the kids are into it. The adults don't really know what's going on, but something that p people might not know is that there's something called a Refinitive Venture Capital Index. So um, here we go. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> so there's so Bitcoin is for spivs. We learned about this last week. You know, traders who aren't necessarily um, necessarily know what they're doing, um, and people have made millions and lost millions. Um, there's some venture capitalists who are supposed to be professional investor, investors with lots of credentials and cufflinks and Hermes ties and, and $500 shoes. And the index that tracks their investments is down, I, I should you not, almost exactly to the percent that Bitcoin is down from the peak. And the reason I bring that up is because, and, and it nowhere near, it doesn't get anywhere near as much press. Um, you know, it's not something necessarily I thought we were going to talk about today, but it just sort of reminds you that there's loads of professional, really fancy investors with all these models and kids from Harvard and MBAs out of, out of, coming out of everywhere who've lost just as much money um, as a function of what we've discussed a lot, which is the changing of the regime that we're dealing with, which is less liquidity, higher interest rates, higher inflation world. And so I just think it's fun to, rem to, to remember that professionals lose crap loads of money sometimes too. Not Keith, though. Keith. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that's a good point, though, because like, doesn't this come back to like the whole big picture, which is like, okay, you've got rampant inflation, central banks are like acting tough, we're going to act tough on inflation, and they basically come out and talk about the like, you know, reverse wealth effect. And I mean, is this not, I mean, I'm looking at a, a tweet right now, you know, we, we could debate this, but uh, per this this. Cullen Roach's metrics here, $35 trillion in global market value has been erased since the beginning of this year. So that's 14% of all global wealth. So you might disagree with that number. I, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, but um, for reference, this guy, he says 2008 was a 19% decline. But either way you slice it, uh, a lot of wealth has been evaporating, including my Luna account. Uh, so <laughs> second round of drinks will be on shake pay. Um, so, so but, yeah, uh, but I mean, this is this is like, I think like, we were talking about it before we came here, which was like, this is like the perfect time to have like the Looney Hour event. Like all these things have come together, which is like everything we've been talking about, which is markets going to break, central banks are going to keep raising rates, something's going to break. And we're kind of getting closer and closer to that point, which is like, listen, like wealth is literally being evaporated. Like you got the like big tech getting hammered. You know, what, Shopify was the number one stock in Canada. It's now not. Year, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, what is it down? 75, 80%. A lot. A lot. It's 60 billion. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, wealth is being evaporated. And this is basically part of their plan, I think, to rein in inflation. Yeah. So I, d I don't think that central banks sit around, uh, central bankers sit around and go, we're going to, you know, destroy wealth. I don't think that, don't get me wrong, you know, the road to hell was paved in good intentions. I think that they've made mistakes before. They'll make mistakes again. I don't necessarily think that that was their intention, although that ha is what happens. Just one thing on that number, regardless, whenever you hear these numbers, 30 trillion, whatever, you have to normalize it by the size of the economy. 
So it's not enough to say that you're down five trillion or the budget is 400 <coughs> billion or whatever. You have to compare it to something. Obviously, if the global economy is bigger today, then you have to think, okay, well, you have to, you have to common size it. If, you're, if there's any accountants in the room, you call it common size accounting. Um, you simply take that in a figure and you divide it by something that is sort of endogenous, something like the GDP is a useful example, debt to GDP, et cetera. Um, but the other the, the thing that I think that's really different this time from then versus 2008 or nine, and I'll pass it over to Keith, is bonds are a lion's share of that number. I hate bonds. Um, in uh, last year, I wrote a note called why I hate government bonds, and then I wrote another <laughs> note called why I still hate government bonds. <laughs> um, not the best titles I've ever come up with, but I'm really happy I wrote about that. And that's the difference this time. There was a huge, huge, huge um, decline in obviously tech and wealth, but b uh, bonds have lost an incredible amount of money. AAA rated investment grade bonds are down 15%. Treasuries at one point, they're probably up now. The treasuries are down almost 15%. I don't know, Keith. Keith David. the boomer loves his bonds. What do you, what do you <laughs> no. say? No. No. no, he no, doesn't. No, no. He doesn't. I'm we just bonded kidding. over that. <laughs> no pun intended. That's a, bond home, that's a bond owner right there. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we know what Rich's pickup line at the bar is going to be tonight. <laughs> I'm rich. I don't own any bonds. <laughs> Uh, so I do disagree with Rich, though, on uh, what you said a couple minutes ago with central banks and you think not... they want to destroy wealth? Not, yeah, so I have a, a different view on that. Um, so my, my view has been consistent for a while on that. We, we have reached this, this, this end of uh, an 80-year cycle after World War II with Keynesian economics. So basically, they all got together in, in Bretton Woods and they decided we're going to use this economic theory to control the world's economy, and uh, that's what we're going to do. And the world adopted it, and like every theory will run its course. We've now run its course because there are no more interest rates left to cut. Um, they can't cut taxes. They can only try to raise them to try to collect more tax revenues. And uh, that the whole world has just been bloated with all this debt. So with central banks now, for the first time ever, they have political pressure to fix inflation, and they've never had that before. I've, I've met some of the central bankers over the last few years, and uh, you know they don't like, most of them don't like to be in, in the media and limelight and stuff like that. But, but they're really feeling pressure now, so they have to raise rates, but that is not enough to, to change inflation. So in, in the standard, it's, it's my view that if you can't change inflation right now by changing rates, the best way to do is just change demand. Make sure everyone feels they, they feel less wealthy. Um, make sure that there's less jobs floating around, less bonuses and stuff like that. If there's less demand on an aggregate level, that will fix the inflation problem. So it, it's my expectation that is what's happening now. I think that that's what the Chinese are doing as well. You know, they, they have the COVID lockdowns in uh, maybe three of the largest cities, I think, right now. Yeah, I heard something like... I've heard enormous numbers, like 30, 40% of GDP. Something yeah, ridiculous. and I'm, I can be skeptical about a lot of things. And the fact that this COVID uh, has not reached the rest of the world yet, I, I find that a, a bit odd. Also, so, they're not uh, Mickey Mouse-like lockdowns where you're allowed to go walk your dog. You, you, I've seen people lower their dogs from their balcony off a leash. <laughs> I, sw I swear. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> I swear. It's, the Internet's never told a lie. I know. <laughs> It's a good thing Willis isn't in China, right? That's the thing. But anyway, but I, I do have this expectation that monetary policymakers, as well on the fiscal side, um, they, they know that the, the gig is up. So if they can somehow get a soft landing by slowing the economy, because like for, for example, if any, if everybody um, if lost money year to date with their portfolios, uh, you, you feel like you have less money available to spend. You, you get that mindset with it. If your house is declined in value, then you, you feel that same way. So, so that's what they're trying to do. So I think that's, uh, that's where we're headed. You ever heard of that Warren Buffett story? So like apparently like he goes to McDonald's every morning <laughs> and like he goes to the drive through and gets like a breakfast sandwich and like hash browns. But if the market's down, he doesn't get the hash browns. <laughs> like, um, so, I mean, Warren Buffett is probably slowing the, the entire that's, economy. That's down. the trick? That's how you, yeah. that's how he, 
But that, it is, <laughs> is it all? Yeah, that's that's the that's the secret that's the sauce. That's the secret sauce. But it's all like a relative game, right? I mean, you talk about like okay, like shares are down. Like okay, like let's just like hypothetically pretend that I am keep going back to Shopify. But like if I am an employee of Shopify, like I might be getting stock options. Like hey, by the way, like your compensation, like. Yeah. yeah the problem is that I think we like we talk a lot about the, the reason I don't agree with that wealth effect thing is just for me one. I'm going to screw this stat up. Normally, I, when we do this, I have the computer in front of me so I can double check. <laughs> <laughs> um, but something like 80% of the value in the equity market is owned by a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of people. And so that's where I, I that's one of the reasons I don't necessarily agree with that wealth effect being as important. I think your house is much more valuable and much more impactful on, on your spending. If your house is down 20%, it's a large... For most people in this room, I know it is it's true for me. M my house, I own a flat in London. It's 85% of my net worth is that this stupid flat that I should have never bought. Um, <laughs> Sounds like it's doing all right. But but g genuinely, and if and when house if tomorrow that went down 20%, that would affect me. My stock portfolio goes down 20%. For me personally, less than I don't know if you. Well, I mean, that's... I know you've got a real I'm biased, so... <laughs> I mean, I just say I like real estate because I don't have to wake up every morning and look at the ticker and say, oh, my God. <laughs> um, you know, Kitsilano real estate never goes down. Yeah, I know. Um, Sorry, where is Kitsilano? Anyways. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I still think... Um, I don't know. I, I think it's still relative. I mean, how do you think? Um, who's the guy that got his tattoo of Luna on his on his? On oh, his not me. Right? <laughs> One of the Billy Mike Novogratz. Oh, jeez. Yeah. So. Yeah. I think someone is hungry right now. Do you think so? Yeah. Think someone should eat a snack at this point <laughs> yes. in time. That's Actually, yeah. yeah. I mean, that is. Well, I think. Funny. I think it's snack time. I'm gonna, I'm for, gonna, you I'm owe gonna, us a, a Twinkie, funny. eh? All right, I'll it's do that. So happens Come on, that everyone. Let's get it. While you eat it, I'm going to read off the ingredients. <laughs> I was I, actually, I, I was planning to do this at the beginning of the episode. I totally forgot. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah This yeah, is the sure, Twinkie sure. that was missed four you, episodes ago. Tartrazine. <laughs> Polysorbate 60. Whenever Anything with a number in it. No, I'm kidding. You should have got a sponsorship from a Twinkie. This is <laughs> it's oh. not so bad, eh? It's actually not so bad. <laughs> I'm not going to make it through the episode here. <laughs> <laughs> um, while Ke while Steve um, eats that horrible Twinkie, why don't I? What we talked was we were talking about some data that you wanted me to go over. Should I do that? Yeah, quickly? so it's a washroom break, bar break, what which goes through <laughs> CPI data. Okay, so um, again, normally I have my computer in front of me, so if I screw this up, forgive me. Uh, U.S. CPI came out. Um, CPI is Consumer Price Index. Yes, I understand that it understates inflation. It does so in Canada and most other countries too. But what I thought was really important was that, so the core dropped to 6.2% year on year, headline to 8.2. It's a lot more boring when there's a bunch of people sitting in front of you. <laughs> um, uh, core X shelter, so I've been on this shelter. One of the reasons I thought it's not transitory we can talk about, you know, Tiff Macklin not... You well, know, you can get a shelter. Yeah, sorry? Yeah. You can get a shelter. Yeah. Anyway, so um, so shelter up 5.1, food, whatever. Anyways, I'm not going to go over on it. But what I think is really important um, is for the first time in a long time, we finally, finally see that it's actually stopped rising at the pace that it has been for a long, long, long time. So I, I, I refer refer referenced it earlier. It looks like a little fish hook. It literally was just going through the moon. And if you look at the chart now, it just curls and we're starting to see <coughs> slowing in some key things. Something else that came out yesterday was the US PPI, which is the producer price index. So that's the input costs from lots of, so if you're for a producer, a manufacturer, plastics, resins, you build boats, cars, you build Keith's mansion or whatever. Um, you get you, you obviously do the same type of thing instead of having a consumer basket, you have a producer basket, and those prices actually came down too. Problem is you have a situation where Keith will allude to, which is services are very very sticky, and they, they just keep rising and rising. So anyway, well I'm just gonna jump in there because I actually did um, I did a interview with uh, Professor Steve Keen. I don't know if anyone's familiar with him. I think he's brilliant. He's written a couple books. Uh, I think he knows the monetary system inside and out. Um, he's not like your traditional economist. But like his basically takeaway was this like and I was like you know it's not like transitory but he's like listen it is predominantly supply based like you have 
supply chains that are bottlenecked through China still running a COVID zero policy. You have this, I think, I mean, he calls it the end of, I mean, which is pretty obvious, the end of, you know, globalization to some extent, to some extent. Yeah. Some re-onshoring. That's definitely happening. But I, I, you know me, I like this end of this and end of that, that it's the never again. And it's always, the, come on now. Yeah, well, the world, the yeah, world is integrated. I mean, we literally only, frankly, we met today. But you're seeing the a lot of manu- that- <laughs> <laughs> No, but I mean it, right? Like, I, I mean, I know this guy has glasses. No, but the idea that you know, <laughs> <laughs> the idea that you're not going to buy your ball bearing from some mousy company in southern Japan, it, global end of globalization, I think, strong. I do. Okay, agree strong with, words, but you get the point. Yeah, no, he's great. No, I love Steve. No, make no mistake, I love Steve. So his really his smart. sort of idea was like, yeah, like listen, like these guys are going to like try to like bring inflation back down to two percent thinking that they can do that. But like the, a lot of it is not going to be, you can't really fix this problem necessarily by jacking rates up. But yeah, you, you can definitely crash markets in the process. And I think we're already seeing that in crypto and big tech. So, I mean, I don't, again, I don't know if you have any sort of additional thoughts on that, but. So I suspect what, so we now you know, always talk about the world, the investment world. We live in a world with, with probabilities and it's never a 0% or 100%. It's, it's somewhere in between. And when the probability you know, changes dramatically in one direction, you know, that, 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 what's, that's what catches our attention. So I think right now, the, the probability of inflation peaking soon, and I don't mean it's gonna come back down to one or 2%, maybe it's 4%. I think it's gonna be sticky for a while. But we, we, we now have these three events that have taken place, and it's like they, they've never happened at the same time. So we have interest rates are rising, in most of the world. I want to talk about that as, as well in, in, in a second. But mainly the, the, the Americans. So the, the Americans are raising rates aggressively and you know they're the kingmaker out of all this. Uh, you have commodity prices are going up aggressively. So when they're putting the gas in your car and stuff like that and your, your groceries, that's going up. And then at the same time, we have the US dollar, which, which is surging. So like we, those that know me, I've been talking about this event for quite some time. And I, I think it is the, the ultimate last trade that we'll all make before we go to some new kind of system would be the short the dollar. But before, like the pathway towards that, it'd be the emerging market world and you know, Canada, Australia, and then Europe, Japan, and, and, then, and then the US. But with three, the, the, three of these events happening at the same time, so rates going higher, commodity prices going up you know, with inflation, and the dollar getting stronger, like that in itself is going to cause someone to go off sides, which will you know reduce global, the global economy, aggregate demand, and stuff like that. So now, as Rich said, you know, like he doesn't believe in this, you know, this abrupt end to everything. The world is self-healing, and so is the economy. So I, I think you know we are we won't continue on this rampant surge with inflation, but we can I can easily see the the probability has increased where these three phenomena or events combined it, it's hard on demand like the global economy is rolling off pretty hard now and then which again should lead us to our bank of canada discussion because i i happen to think that one of the greatest trades coming up will involve i call it shorting the bank of canada i, I did it a couple of years ago and i think that's coming up <laughs> again <dare> uh, pretty <laughs> soon yeah. tiff macklem couldn't make it tonight unfortunately <laughs> Um, you know, it's interesting, actually, a couple couple news articles, so like, you know, Keith, you've always talked about, um, you know, like, they'll kind of like dabble it out there, they'll kind of like plant the seed. The trial balloon, was it? it trial balloon? Anyway, here we go. Yeah, trial balloon. They'll plant, they'll plant the trial balloon and just kind of float it up there and sort of see how everyone digests it. So literally, like, in the last two to three days, two articles coming out, like, the headline, um... National Post. The National Post says, the way the housing market is stalling, the Bank of Canada may have to hit the brakes sooner than expected. Shocking. Uh, And then from today, the Globe and Mail. The Globe and Mail comes out and says, interest rate trajectory will depend heavily on housing market, BOC deputy says. So it's like, I don't know, we're already starting to talk about, oh, well, you know, we should watch this, but they're trying to act tough on housing and and, uh, on inflation. Um, it seems like they've kind of already planted that seed. I don't know if you have any sort of thoughts on that, but yeah, I think you know. So right now, the the markets are pricing in the Bank of Canada going from a current one percent. We are at one now. Are we at is it one percent? Yeah. Uh, okay, we're at one. <laughs> we just round a number up or down. That, that's what we like to do. That's not true. I'm but really the, <laughs> I know. but it's going to be up to three percent by December. Never going to 
exactly. So we're looking at what, you know, seven, eight months to have 200 basis points in increases. And that's not a, a, an average of what, you know, economists are predicting. It's what the market has already priced in. So when I talk about like one of these great trades that are coming up, if you can anticipate when that trend is going to end, then there are ways to make a lot of money on it. So it's happening with the Canadians. It's happening in, with the Americans as well. Um, what, what's really funny, I, I love the Europeans. I like to call Europe the economic fantasy land called Europe. <laughs> and uh, the, the other day, someone at the ECB, they, they tweeted out and they quoted it, and they said, yeah, we anticipate raising rates to 0% by year end. <laughs> <laughs> So I look at the world, you know, I like to tell, uh, to get things in a bit of a narrative, but, um, oh, maybe it's time for a story. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet, the story will come up. But um, the, the way, look, just to finish up the central bank stuff, the way to think of it right now, you know the game Monkey in the Middle? So we, you know, right now, I'm Sorry, Steve, what? Is this monkey, a PlayStation? No, no, no. The, <laughs> in the old days, we played we play that with rocks, right? Because we were, we, were, we were tough. Uh, so, you know, we got... <laughs> So, but picture the world, okay? Steve is in the middle. <laughs> this is outside. This is what? Outside. A sock? Outside. <laughs> no, right here. But Steve's in the middle, and, and, you know, Rich and I are on both ends. And if Rich and I are, are both skilled, and Steve isn't, he doesn't have a chance. We're, we're always going to, you know, get the ball back and forth. If Steve is more skilled than one of us, it's game over. He's going to win in, in the middle. Think of, so take that really bad analogy with central banks. So we have the Americans, they're right in the middle, and it is called king dollar for a reason. It's not king euro, king yen, or anything else. It's king dollar. They are raising rates, they're reducing their balance sheets, which means they're taking money out of the system, and the rest of the world is frantically trying to keep up. That's what's happening here in Canada. Meanwhile, on, on each side, we have China, um, Hong Kong, and Japan, and, and they can't do that. They can't raise rates, so they're really struggling. And then on the other side of, of the pond over here is the ECB. As I mentioned, if they raise rates, they'll get it to 0%. And, and that's the world. I think it was the last week, Rich, that you mentioned the impossible trinity. or yes. something. It was My really favorite pickup line. Yeah. I, I like <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was a great explanation for, for what's happening here right now. And as long as this continues, this is what's putting pressure on the world. So if you're watching right now that the Chinese currency... It continues to deteriorate by the day. But that's a good thing for them, though. They're an export economy. They need a cheaper currency. We've talked about this before. In a normal cycle. Okay. In a normal cycle. Uh, in, in Hong Kong right now, their dollar is pegged to the dollar. And the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, they're now spending money to make sure it doesn't break the, the peg. Oh. In Japan, we know the Japanese story. We went through that. <laughs> Let's talk about the pegs, though. because Pegs? Okay, yeah. Again, my Luna peg broke. <laughs> Uh, Luna peg broke. What's the uh, tether peg broke? Apparently, it's just rebounded somewhat, but for now, uh, does the Hong Kong dollar pegs breaking the, the yen? No, it's not breaking. The, the well, pressure it's not, okay, it's is not there. Breaking. But you're a good point. If, if a peg does break, it just creates chaos everywhere. And so that's that's my point, though. And, and in Japan, which we did talk about a couple of weeks ago, um, so Japan they had to make a decision either to save their bond market or save the currency market. And they have to save the bond market. There's no if and buts about it. Because if the bond market goes down, it means that the, the banks go under, the insurance companies go under, and the pension funds go under. And like, that just doesn't work. And then we have Europe on the other side. So even, you know, even Mario Draghi, you know, what, what's his title now in Italy? Is he president or? Technical director. Of He's the the unelected, team. <laughs> yeah, the unelected leader of Italy now. But he even came out and he said, hey, if, if, if the ECB, president. if they raise rates, you know, it, it's really going to make it difficult for Italy to, 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 to service their debt. And meanwhile, we have, you know, Steve in the middle as the American. You know, he, he's raising rates. Like, he's just turning the screws on this stuff. So I, l I really like this from an investment perspective because when, when it's creating all these pressures around the world, it, it just creates opportunities. So that's the... Yeah, but how, yeah. uh, how far can the Fed get, though, is my question. Well, that's what like, I want well, to... Talk. Yeah, because, like, you know, again, like, uh, not, they don't care about the crypto market. Obviously, they're probably happy that it's evaporating. But, I mean, tech's getting crushed. The stock market's down, what, 17% year-to-date? I mean, just, just, like, some context, if I may. Like, there's... Everyone is always... Can, like, so there's... So 
Keith alluded to the fact that there is interest rates that are priced in, and the way in Canada it's a banker, banker's acceptance contract, in the US it's a Fed funds, um, and it's basically an interest rate, uh, it's basically paper, it's some kind of interest rate product that's pulled to par, basically, that's, it's, you know, it, it start either, you know, it starts below 100, I'm gonna screw this up, it starts below 100, and eventually, uh, depending on what you think your interest rate will be expected in the future, you know, it's basically 100 minus that number, and it'll basically, you can use it to price out what you think is gonna be uh, the interest rate in 30 in 30 days in 60 days there's hundreds of different permutations you can have for these interest rate agreements now the problem i have with this idea that they're going to raise and everyone's so convinced that the just because the interest rate market is telling you that this is this path is what's going to happen we've seen it time and time and time again I, I say this to my clients there's a caterpillar chart i think we've talked about that on the podcast before it looks like a caterpillar it looks like you see the fed funds rate which is this choppy very you know kind of um straight line chart, and then you've got these little uh, legs that look like a centipede or a caterpillar come off. And the reason I bring that up is because the interest rate expectations are always, always super, super aggressive. And then, as you guys have talked about many times, once you start raising rates, things break, and then the Fed is forced to change its, its, its behavior and change its path of interest rate. They are not totally... Um, you know, you know they don't they don't totally ignore what's going on in the markets, and so that's why when it's you know we see these three percent interest rates being priced in, I just don't buy it. And that back to you, why I think we're going to be right about the two or three to four rate hike call. Uh, which <laughs> I think I'm still going to be wrong. I, though. I know I think you're going to be closer wrong. than I think you're going to be closer. I than think what I say I think I said three to four. It I might be five or whatever what it is. Now, three. Anyways, three. who's three. counting? We're at three. But um, then June will be. 50 basis points. But what I'm saying, but so that's technically, let's call that five. Yeah. And then maybe, maybe they're done after that. I don't so, know. so the next two meetings are for 50 basis points for each meeting. Yeah. But there's so one 50 more, and another 50. There's just one more thing I wanted to add. So I think the difference between 2008 and, sorry, this mini tangent, the thing that's different now is that like in 2008, the banks were t in the U.S. were bust. That's it. And they used quantitative easing to recapitalize them for better or for worse. Let's, that's not discussion. But what I, the reason I think it's slightly different, not as dire as Keith, obviously, I guess I'm the optimist of the bunch. But the, it's a, you know, the banks are extremely well capitalized. Loan to value, loan to deposit ratios in America are very, very low, meaning they have a lot, a lot of firepower and, and they can and are lending to consumers. You can see consu uh, credit card lending is ripped as consumers are trying to keep up with inflation. Um, and so to me, it's not enough to say that the Fed is contracting its balance sheet, to me what matters is monetary money supply in aggregate. And that is still going up. And I don't think it's, it, unlike in 2008 where you had, it has been, if it, when it was flat for 10 years, monetary money supply x the Federal Reserve was flat for 10 years. It was a depression, not a recession. You hear, heard it here first. But the, anyway, that's, I think well, it's- I was gonna say, you want, if you wanna talk about lending, <laughs> uh, so that's a good, good, good stat here. So Canadian mortgage debt, uh, which is everyone's favorite debt to, to, to binge on. Canadian mortgage debt grew by an average of $150 billion per year yeah, uh, in 2020 and 2021. That was almost double the annual growth uh, between 2015 and 2019. Uh, and again, we had a bull market from 2015 to like 2017. So like, it wasn't like we had like weak demand in the credit space. So uh, we actually, as in Canada right now, we're actually running at... Um, a 14 year high, 14 year high for residential mortgage credit growth. So if you're wondering why, are, and this gets back to my original interview with Professor Steve Keen, who's kind of explained this all, which is like 90 to 95% of all new like money that's created into circulation is created through bank lending. And then predominantly in Canada, that's not created through like new business loans, that's created through people borrowing money uh, for a mortgage to buy a home. And so when you see demand start to slow uh, in the housing market because rates are now at, f every, every mortgage now uh, is north of, this is official, uh, 4%. So if you're looking for a five-year fixed uninsured mortgage, uh, advertised rate is all north of 4% now. We haven't seen that since 2010. Now you tack on like where house prices are today, it's no surprise that home sales are slowing dramatically. And in greater Vancouver, you know, yes, it's a year-over-year -year base effect, but uh, sales were down 34% year over year. But we were told to borrow. <laughs> but now it all comes back to the same point, which is, uh, yeah, it's Tiff Macklem told everyone to blow their brains out, and thus they did, clearly by that statistic. But uh, so the year over year base effect is starting to change. 
and um, that's just in Vancouver. In Canada, it is, but in the U.S., it's different. And Ontario is a train wreck. Yeah. But they're they're talking about uh, so all of this is predicated like the Bank of Canada's whole speech. If you look at their monetary policy report, which they publish, you know, publicly for free, is that like housing is basically going to essentially stay flat. So they think they're going to get to this like magical three percent overnight rate. We're at one percent, and everything's blowing up, including my portfolio, <laughs> and they're going to get to three yeah, percent. And but housing is going to be totally robust because like immigration and, and I just think it's like this is like this fantasy land. I agree. <laughs> we figured it out. Keith, <laughs> I agree with you. I mean, higher rates just it, it makes it more difficult, you know, for the market. Um, what? Are, but, you, but give us some example in terms of like mortgage payments. Are they changing dramatically over the last month or so? I think it was I don't a, follow this that closely. Well, yeah, I think we've chatted about this before on the show, but I think it was like nationally, if you take where the home price index is today, which measures like the typical home in Canada, and I get it, every market's a little bit different. You go from rates at like 2% six months ago to today at 4%, like it raises the typical mortgage payment by $800 per month. Yeah. So it's like, where is the average Canadian coming up with $800 a month? Then they factor on like food inflation, record inflation at the gas pumps, et cetera, et cetera. And, et cetera. and anemic wage growth in Canada. Unlike mm-hmm. in the US where there's wage growth of six, seven, eight percent. But if you're age if you're between the ages of sixteen and twenty four, which I know is a very small amount, you're getting wage growth of like ten percent year on year, which is pretty good. Um, McDonald's baby. Yeah, McDonald's <laughs> baby. Um, my question for you though is is supply st- I, I think I asked you this question like six months ago. And I mean at the time it was different. I think we we're still in the midst of the, the lockdowns or whatever it is, but Supply still hasn't. That's so it takes a long time, though, right? Like, nobody's nobody's panicking to sell their house right now. No one's like, oh my god, rates are up four percent. Listen to the loony hour. And I gotta like, <laughs> ham- you know, I gotta hammer the button. Like, nobody does that. Like, everybody, like, everyone still sets their price and like, you know, my neighbor sold for two million dollars in February at the peak. So like, I'm I'm I ain't taking less than two point one. It's like what's. <laughs> Then I sit there with like a stale listing and run around for six months and like it doesn't sell and like so. So there's just n- like some month supply or whatever it is. is I know in the U.S. Yeah, months of inventory is slowly increasing, but it's gonna take months and months and months to like get that to a level where like it's now going from like record low to like balance, and that's where you start to see more like downwards pressure. What's, like what's the average or what's it, what is it? Sh- we're, what's ba- like- we're basically like two months of inventory. So like a balanced market mm-hmm. would be in Vancouver. Like you need to get that like north between like three to four months. Is okay. like a balanced market, and once you get north of four, like that's like, and it's not prices. linear, right? As soon as if you get if you get way over four, then prices really come off. Yeah, right? they come off yeah, quite a bit. Okay. Yeah, but like again, it takes time. Like housing is so sticky. I just don't like everyone like equates it to like the stock market. Like I have these guys on Twitter, like housing is gonna drop fifty percent by the end of the year. Watch, mark my words. I'm like, mm, that's not really how it works. Like, <laughs> like, well, you can just you need a place to live. I think. Most, yeah. most people, I think. Like, where are you going to go? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So now, like, what we're seeing basically is, like, housing demand is, like, falling, and it's falling, I think, much more aggressively than any policymaker is probably actually aware of. But, um, that, but, but we're seeing a robust, like, crazy demand in the rental market. Is that, like, a fake market, though? You know, like, the housing market, you know, when you look at the stock market, it's, you're put, there's, for every, whenever you see a ticker, like, you know, you know Tesla's worth $1,000, that might be literally tens of thousands of trades at above and just below, which squeezes what's known as a bid-ask spread. So uh, an institutional investor might come and say, we want to buy 100,000 shares of Apple at $1,001. And then another person might say, we want to buy 20 million shares at, you know, 1,000, I know this is boring, and 50, you know what I'm saying? Like, so it squeezes that bid-ask spread really, really, really tight. In housing, do, do you get, I mean, how does it work? You just get a lot of stuff that goes like no bid, or like the bid comes in low, and the seller's like, "Nah, I'm gonna sit on my price for the next like." But that one, it's what gaps down three months, and then a lot of the times, like, ah, oh, let's change the realtor, and like, actually, let, let's <laughs> <laughs> let's change the realtor and list it a hundred thousand dollars higher. That should probably move. <laughs> we'll like, rearrange the furniture. Or whatever. Yeah, yeah, it's it's it's, it's 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 never like it's never a price problem. It's like a marketing problem. Okay. It's like this guy sucks. <laughs> like, so yeah, that's wel- welcome to my life. Tell us how you really yeah, feel, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but no, but that's why I think housing is so sticky. Like I, people are like, when should I buy? I'm like, I don't know. Like it depends obviously a, if mortgage rates stay where they are, but like B it's like, just so you know, like housing, if you're like, it's not going to make a difference if you wait two months. Like if you really want to like try to time the market and get extra creative, like you might be waiting 12 months to actually get like a decent bargain. 
Because like nobody's just like instantly hammer my price down 15%. They just sit on it forever. We saw that in 2017, 18 here. So what, so what would happen then if rate expectations changed to all of a sudden rates are going lower again? I think that changes the psychology. In the same in, we a, saw po- that in a positive way. In correct. a positive way. Because we saw that in 2018, yeah. like the rates got to three and a half and everyone's like, oh my God, they're going to go to four. Let nobody, nobody buy. So we had a 20-year low in home sales in Greater Vancouver, 10-year low in Greater Toronto, which is the only two markets in Canada that actually matter. Uh, How dare you? Well, I mean, <laughs> they are the two largest markets. So if you're a policymaker, those are the two markets that you're looking at. And so, yeah, home housing activity basically collapsed. Thank God uh, Jay Powell came in and cut rates mm-hmm. uh, when, you know, everyone was, was it, was it Christmas Eve when, like, they issued, oh, they issued that statement? They're like, the, the we are solvent like it was uh trump's advice i don't know the, who's the economic advisor for for trump who who oh, issued Mickey Mouse? Yeah. i don't know <laughs> who issued the christmas eve statement it was like a statement being like we are solvent like and then like jay powell cut rates like a month later <laughs> i it could be a conspiracy theory i don't know <laughs> um, but anyway so yeah. that that's kind of what happened so like basically rates in canada went from three and a half they went back down to like two and a half within like three four months and like housing activity then ramped back up. And then going into COVID, we were actually in a hot market. Um, so I think that's kind of the similar thing, right? Rates are at 4% today. I mean, people are like, oh, they're going to go to four and a half, five, seven percent 7%, and housing is going to reset. And so we're actually seeing a, a slight decline, actually, in the, uh, in the bond market as well. The but I mean, that's, that's well. the short end of the interest rate curve, right? So yeah. in, for interest for bonds, you have... I mean, you can, you can issue, I mean, we've talked about this before, the bond market is much bigger than the equity market. And in bonds, you have, you can lend at three months, you can lend at six months, all the way until 30-year bonds, right? <laughs> Canada issues 30-year paper. By the way, that's down 20% this year. <laughs> um, and, um, but I mean, doesn't it, like, doesn't it affect where in the yield curve it's going up and down or no, not at all? It's just the front end of the curve is the only thing that matters for the housing market? Or? I think the only thing that matters for the housing market is the five-year bond. Okay. Because every, like, most people, I think, was it 60% of, typically 60, 65% of mortgages okay. are going fixed and they're going okay. with a five-year okay. fixed, give or take. Because the reason I ask that is because you know, there are things, like, the central, we've talked about this before, right? Central banks have some impact on yeah. banks. But I mean, there are endogenous factors that affect what should be the risk-free rate. Okay, so well, yeah, we, and we've chatted about this before, which is the argument of like, okay, if you can't, if the if the central bank can't necessarily control like the longer end or the medium end of the curve, what can they control? Well, they can control the overnight rate, which, for example, would be your variable rate mortgage. And so, I mean, what we've seen over the last eighteen months is like an inordinate amount of Canadians going for variable rate mortgages. It's like, well, I can get a variable at 1.2% and the fix is at 22 Like, no brainer. If Tiff Macklem told me to do that he's going to keep rates at, at zero. <laughs> We're not allowed to criticize of, yeah. central bankers. Um, I did you not read the article in the National Post today? Yeah. Anyways. Unapproved. There's uh, a couple of things I wanted to talk about data-wise, which I think, if I may, it won't be long. I promise wrap it, it won't up. be boring. <laughs> Shipping costs are going down. Hooray. Um, so there's two two ways I look at this. There's called the Shanghai um, Shipping Index, and there's something called the Harpex. The Looney Hour mugs are not on sale. <laughs> yeah. And um, this is really important for our inflation outlook and you know peaks of inflation or whatever, and that's coming off. And the other thing I wanted to talk about was gold. I mean, we don't really talk about gold, but gold track real interest rates. So what's a real interest rate? Is an inf- um, so it's an interest rate adjusted for inflation, um, and if you invert. The, in, uh, the real interest rate, it just basically tracks gold. And you can't, and why is it? Because you need, it's expensive to hold this, you pull the gold out of the ground, you put it on a truck, put it in, you put it back in the ground. And there's something called the inconvenience yield. Anyway, so something I just wanted to tell you guys. Keith's backyard's paved. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know, is there, any, and, uh, is there anything else you guys saw in the markets that you wanted to talk about? Well, I think we need to talk about risk. And I mean, good timing. You're a little late for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I miss a lot of the risk this year, so it's, it's been okay. Um, but I want to make the point that risk can come from anywhere, and it's probably when you're not e- expecting it. So it, it is time for the story. It's the story that's going to come. Here we go. So um, hey, Going on with a bang here. Here we go. Or thud. Half an hour later. <laughs> <laughs> a long time ago when I was a little boy, now, uh, a, few years, a few years ago, I was climbing Mount Rainier, so down there by Seattle, 
And um, so you're, when you're doing, you're doing alpine stirrups, you're climbing at night because it reduces the risk. Because at night, you know, there's no sun shining on the ice, so crevasses won't open. So it's, it's just safer to do it that way. Sounds really risky, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so we're climbing. We're up high. I think it's maybe 12,000 feet, somewhere in that range. We're around this part of the mountain. They, they call it the disappointment cleaver. So you're in three groups of four. You're roped up, again, for safety to reduce risk. And we have our, your headlamps on, and you were on crampons and harnesses and all this stuff. Again, everything to reduce risk. And you're going in this rope-like fashion, a straight l or a line. And all of a sudden, the line stops. And, and this guy, Scott from Winnipeg, says, hold up. And everyone stops. So what's wrong? He says, I have to poo. <laughs> and the lead guy says, Scott, this is not a good place to poo. <laughs> He said, like, to the left is a long way down, and to the right is a longer way down. Like, this is not a good spot. Can you hold it? He said, no, I got to go. So everyone, so no one moved. We're all lined up, you know, waiting for, for Scott to poo. <laughs> so if you mountain climb before, and you have all this gear on in the middle of the night, it's, it's, it's a tricky thing to do, especially with, you know, a drop off on each side. So, and you're wearing a harness as well, so it, it's tricky. So anyway, so, so Scott, he, he manages to do his poo, and, um, and then when you finish, you have to blue bag it, because you've got to take it out, you know, carry in, carry out. So the we're... Neighbor's going to get upset or something? Or? He's what? Neighbor's going to get upset? <laughs> <laughs> so he's there all of a sudden, and then the lead guy says, Scott, come on, we've got to go. And he says, I can't find it. So now we're like, what's going on? So we all turn around with our lights on, on Scott, <laughs> trying to find his poo. And he's looking around, and we can't find it. So finally the guide says, are you sure you pooed? And he said, yes, I'm sure I pooed. <laughs> so he's like, okay, we can't wait anymore. We, we got to keep going, guys. We got to keep going. So you know, Scott starts putting his stuff together, and then he, he puts his jacket on, and he puts his hood on. <laughs> to which then Scott said, I found it. Why does this have to do with risk in markets? <laughs> My point is that risk can come from anywhere. So now I'm serious again. <laughs> so, it, but as prepared as we were for that climb, and as Scott was, apparently, or not, but the point is with markets, like never go, if you're going to make an allocation to a market, whether it's, what would you call it? Luna? Luna. Luna. Terra. Okay. Um, we all know what we're comfortable with in terms of risk and, and a loss. And for some people, it's a lot more, a lot less than others. So with, with your portfolio, so you, you should allocate it that way. So then when the risk comes out of nowhere, like which, which what's been happening now this year, because it's been a pretty you know, dramatic change with markets over you know, seven, eight months, right? So, uh, but just be prepared for it and you know, we'll, we'll get through you know, all this volatility we have coming on. Be prepared like Keith. He brought us Depends on the trip. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good way to wrap it up. <laughs> Spot on. Maybe. Uh, as always, thanks for tuning in, and we appreciate the support, obviously, all you guys and everyone here thank coming you. out. And, uh, yeah, thank you so much. We're, we're extremely humbled. Uh, the Looney Hour community, what are we, 31 episodes in and, and drawing a pretty good crowd, so... Um, yeah, again, just share this episode with one person. We appreciate it. Hang out for drinks. Uh, love to meet you all, and uh, thanks for coming out.